Good morning all. Here in the studio and to those online, welcome to this press conference, which is a prelude to the 40th meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community. To bring us all up to date on what will take place over the next two days, over the following two days on Thursday and Friday and Wednesday as well, three days, we have with us the Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, His Excellency Ambassador Irwin Larocque. The Ambassador, the Secretary General will make opening remarks following which he will take your questions. Ambassador Larocque. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. And let me say good morning to members of the media here and those who are following us and understand we are streamed live. I want to say a pleasant good morning. But I want to thank you very much for being here with us, uh, joining, uh, not giving me the opportunity to share with you what the uh, next few days um, hold for us. As you know that we're, the 40th meeting of the Heads of Government will be held here in St. Lucia. Um, under the chairmanship of the Prime Minister, Honorable Alan Chastney, who assumed the chair um, on the 1st of July. Um, we expect a, a full house of member states. All, all member states will be represented. We will have 11 heads of government uh, joining us um, as far as the member states. And we have four heads from the associate members. So we, we have a fairly, a fairly full house. And um, the other member states are represented at the ministerial level. Um, we expect to have uh, two special guests with us. Um, Honorable Erna Solberg, the Prime Minister of Norway, will be a special guest and will interact with heads. And His Excellency Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, will also be here with us um, for an interaction with the heads. Um, the opening ceremony, as you may know by now, will take place on Wednesday afternoon at 4.30 at the Royalton Hotel. Um, there will be four speakers. The Chairman, Prime Minister Chastney, the immediate past chairman, uh, Prime Minister Timothy Harris um, of St. Kitts and Nevis, and as well as the Secretary General of the United Nations. He'll also address the opening ceremony, and of course, yours truly will give some opening remarks. The agenda basically, um, we'll be looking at some of the items that we have been looking for in terms of what progress are being made. The CARICOM single market and economy will feature prominently um, once again. Um, you know that we had set some timelines and uh, a work plan that had been agreed to by heads of government and um, basically we'll be getting an update on who was done who has done what and who has not done what um, and see how we move forward there has been some progress but not as much as i think we all might anticipate and for some of you for good reason the private sector labor and civil society will join us representatives of the private sector labor and civil society will join us for the discussions on the csme um, they are representative of the, the persons who will be using, the population at large will be using, who have to make, make use of the CSME. So we'll be hearing from them in terms of how best, um, you know, we could make it uh, more usable and user friendly. There's also going to be a discussion proposals by recognizing the private sector, uh, regional private sector body um, that will be representative and in, have be an interlocutor between uh, the various organs of the community and um, and the private sector. Uh, we've also, I think at the last meeting, we already recognized the, the CCL as a as associate institution. And I, s I guess at some point, we'll be have, to have to be doing the same for civil society. That is just showing that we are seeking to be more interactive, more consultative with, um, with the, the population at large, the, the stakeholders. I should just mention, last night, I had a, a very interesting interaction with the youth of the region through the Car CARICOM Youth Ambassador Corps, and they too are asking for um, some sort of, of, of entry so that there can be some, some dialogue and, and not just tokenism, as they put it, with regards to representation. So the CSMA will be one of the major items, and, and that a link to that is the Commission on the Economy. We had a, appointed, a, reappointed the Commission on the Economy, um, and the, the Commission was given one, one year to do its work, and they, they started the work in, uh, earlier this year and they have to give an interim report. Uh, the, the, the commission is chaired by Dr. Avinash Prasad of Barbados and is made up of a number of prominent individuals, not only regional persons, but, but one or two from, from out of the region. And they will be given an update on that. And that, of course, is linked to the CSME and is linked, of course, to the issue of growth and sustainable growth in our, in our region. Um, another item on the agenda is blacklisting. It's, it's, a, it's a problem that is not going away. Many of our countries um, have been blacklisted. Many of our countries have done what they've asked to be done, and yet they get themselves back on another list. The goalposts keep shifting, and um, we have a, 
a discussion and a strategy on how to go forward. Um, that strategy has been put in place. Prime Minister Shastri himself has been leading on that, along with Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Prime Minister Brown. Um, so I think that's going to be for a very interesting discussion. But the, the, the issue is that we're being backlisted, and very often we're not even being consulted to see what we're doing. That is the member states. Crime and security will also feature very prominently on the agenda. It's, a, it's a, another constant. Um, there's already very strong cooperation on crime and security, but we are seeking to strengthen that cooperation and collaboration among the security apparatus in the region. And that's going to be a, a key point. As you know, we've been putting some of the regional legal framework in place, um, but I think now we're trying to see how we can even step up greater collaboration among the security personnel. As I mentioned to you, Prime Minister of Norway will have an interaction and the UN Secretary General will have an interaction. And some of the issues will, that will be raised with them um, are, are issues of grave concern to us. Climate change, um, sustainable ocean economy. The Prime Minister of Norway heads a, a panel on, on the blue economy, uh, which is something that our region is looking at, and, and the pollution of our, of our oceans, sustainable development goals. These are some of the issues that we will be engaging both of them on. And the Secretary General of the United Nations will be hosting a series of very important meetings in September. So it will also give the heads an opportunity to hear about the plans for those meetings, as well as to um, see how we get our views forward on financing for development, on the issue of uh, resilience building, on the issue of access to financing um, for the sustainable development goals. So we expect um, very, very um, good discussions with the two of them. And since resilience will be an issue that the Prime Minister Shastri, as Chairman, will be putting forward in terms of uh, what are some of the areas, how do we get financing to, um, for, for resilience. Um, it's very easy to get financing after a hurricane, but you need to build resilience before the hurricane, before the disaster strikes or the earthquake. And access to such financing is costly. And how do we get concessional financing to build resilience? So this is another issue we're going to be discussing. There are other items on the agenda, um, such as science and technology, um, which will be introduced um, preliminarily, and a discussion that would relate to our relations with the Af African diaspora uh, will also be um, discussed. Um, of course, you, we expect the border issues, uh, uh, Guyana, Venezuela, and um, Belize, Guatemala, to be also be discussed and update on what's happening there. Um, so that basically is a quick tour of what are the, the items on the agenda um, that will be discussed over the over starting on well Thursday and Friday. There will be a closing press conference, um, so again we'll invite you and be able to report on what actually happened. So that's about the tour. <laughs> Thank you very much, Secretary General. We will now take your questions, and please re remember when you are asking your questions to state your name and the agency which you represent. Janika Simon from Choice TV. Is it working? I'm hoping so. Um, Secretary General, thank you so much for your time today and for taking our questions. Um, I have a question about CSME. Uh, in 2017, I believe, it was Jamaica who had a, a commission to review that country's engagement with CARICOM and CARIFORUM. The report that was issued was, shall we say, not very salutary in terms of the single market and, eco um, and economy, its impact on CARICOM citizens' lives, as well as the benefits that um, it was bringing to Jamaica and, by extension, the rest of the region. Could you tell me, since that report came out, what discussions or what actions have been taken to strengthen the framework and to um, make it uh, better functioning for mm. the lives of CARICOM citizens, please. Okay. You, you would recall that the, the report, as you said, came out and it was first tabled in 2017 in Montego Bay in Jamaica. And there was a discussion, uh, a more thorough discussion when the heads met in special session in Trinidad and Tobago in December of 2018. And that led to what I referred to or the implementation plan. Out of that, some timelines were set to get some things done. And most of those, I would say about 90, 95% of those things are things to be done by the member states. And the timelines were laid out um, to carry us over a period of, I believe, three or four years. Um, that is the plan I referred to that is going to be under review uh, at, the, at the session today. Um, the trade ministers had, had a look at it. 
um, because the trade ministers are the ones that are going to be monitoring it more, more and more. The Jamaica Commission report <coughs> raised a number of other issues that pertain to the general operation of, the, of, the, of, of CARICOM, some of which we already have in train um, and which is going to be applied to not only the CSME but just about every work program that we put in place. Results-based management. We, we have to show results for what we're doing. And the Caribbean Development Bank has been very, very um, helpful in working with us, um, financing um, a resource-based management system, not only for the Secretariat, but for the regional institutions, as well as for member states. We're actually going to be proposing to the member states that they need now need to do that, um, so that one can be accountable for the commitments that are made um, when, you, when, you, when you do so at a meeting. Um, very often, it's not a secret, um, commitments are made and the, the, the dates pass and we haven't done it. So despite all the work, all the groundwork may have, may have been prepared. So th we're going to be having a more focused look. I think um, Prime Minister Mia Motley has really taken up that challenge um, and is leading the charge in that, in that regard. So that is the plan that we've referred to that will be reviewed and uh, quote unquote a report card of sorts will be given today. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my question has to do with agriculture and, and food security. Uh, one of the biggest criticisms of CARICOM as a block is that, well, some of the criticisms point to that there appears to be no or uh, not that big a move, or you see no steps towards actually ensuring food security as it relates to reducing our food import bill. Um, could you speak to us about what steps CARICOM is taking right now? Because one of the, one of the points that has been raised is that um, we as a region, as a subgrouping is um, strong enough, should be strong enough for certain countries or certain members to be able to at least supply certain, certain foods and certain, certain which are native or endemic to, to, to their respective countries as a bit to reducing this import bill. So could you speak to CARICOM's efforts, please? Sure. The food import bill is very, very significant. It's, it's more than four billion US dollars in our region. The food import bill in itself presents opportunities, but it also presents challenges because as you know, of that $4 million, if you dissect it down into what are the various types of foods that we import, not everything is produced in our region. A substantial amount of it is not produced in our region. That notwithstanding, it leaves the opportunity open for production in those items in which we can produce. And um, we have, uh, at the CARICOM level, um, prepared and adopted a food and nutrition security policy. Member states have used that. It was done in a modular format. And member states have used that to de develop their own national food and nutrition security policies, and some of them have actually gone further and done action plans. And the Secretary has worked with these member states all along the way, in, in sometimes even um, providing um, technical support through funding that we may have received from FAO or one of the other organizations. If, if FAO and AICA have co collaborated with us very, very much on that, and CARDI, uh, it's a collaborative effort to work with the member states. And where we, we I, if I'm not mistaken, just about all of the member states technical assistance was provided to the member states to prepare national action plans. Now, what is the status of that? I don't have that information at hand. But the, the issue of food security across our community also has questions of um, sanitary and phytosanitary, you know, the, the standards to allow foods to go in, for instance, um, that we're working on as well. The issue of transportation is one that bedevils us because if you produce, get the first produce to market on time is another issue. Um, so there are a number of issues that we're working on at different fronts that um, one of the things that will be discussed that has been raised with the private sector, I mentioned that they'll, they'll be meeting with us. It will not take place at this setting, but it has do been done preliminarily. How, what, would, what would be needed for the private sector to boost production of various products? And of course, agro-industry is a critical one for us. What is needed? What, what, the, what, what we do with the CSME is to create the environment to allow for the trade in goods to take place without any hindrance, as much as is possible. But the, the governments don't produce. The secretary doesn't produce anything in terms of food, <laughs> that is. We produce a lot of documents, mm -hmm. but not food. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Peter, behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's the private sector who, produ who produce the food, and, and what is it, what is it that, um, that we require for them? So that will be another discussion that we're hoping to have 
with the private sector at the next sitting. But just to follow up to that, mm. um, I will just point to St. Lucia about four years ago, three, four years ago, where our Ministry of Agriculture sought to increase the quota of local chicken and to be purchased by our supermarkets and our other our purchase of local chicken and it was met with great resistance by our chamber of commerce and uh, well their members who saw it as a a cheaper al alternative so my question to you is that would you would you be would caricom be more encouraging of governments to give concessions to their local producers as to reduce those costs of those production costs uh, because i think from what i gather um, one of the biggest issues by these retailers, those sellers, is that the, the cost of purchasing locally is too high, whereas they, they could purchase chicken from the United States at much lower cost, um, which you hear on the ground, these things are sometimes two, three years old. They've been packed in containers, they're stuffed with preservatives. Um, so is it time that maybe CARICOM or those boys should be more forceful um, in terms of getting each country uh, to you know, provide more concessions to their local producers and, and businesses in that respect? Well, I don't know what more concessions you refer to because I'm aware that um, just about all our member states, um, I'm not sure if Jamaica has because of the Structural Adjustment Program, but just about all our member states have some system of providing concessions for investments. Um, and I'm not aware, I mean, I, I hear repeated statements being made about not providing the local private sector with, with concessions, but as far as I'm aware, there's a system of concessions that member states manage. Um, some, of it, some of it comes to us in the sense that some of the member states utilize the, the framework of the CSME to seek um, derogations from inputs into manufacturing, for instance, that allows for these items to be imported in that would be to, to assist in the, in the production. You raise a very interesting point, however. The, prim the private sector is not a homogen homogenous group. So you have the producing private sector wanting to produce, and you have the importing private sector saying, I want to import. And that is why we feel that bringing the private sector together at a regional level a representative group. We cannot interact with all of these various factions in the private sector. And the, the proposed private sector organization of the Caribbean, which is what is maybe coming about, um, hopefully can help us to bridge that gap. Um, but the, the is issue of poultry, the poultry association, the poultry association of the Caribbean is very, very active. They, they are one of the um, groups that we meet with regularly, that is at the, at the regional level. Um, they're coordinating among the various producing groups. And um, we are satisfied that they are producing quality products and they, they have the capacity. Um, in some of our countries, like in Guyana, for instance, where the, the market base is there, um, there's hardly any poultry products imported. They're self-sufficient. I think it's a little more difficult to break even in smaller, smaller populations. And that's where the, 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 the need to export for economies of scale becomes very important. And again, the standards for the foods. But we have to encourage local production. You've pointed to the fact that we import sometimes poultry imported into the region that's, that's months and months old. And there's nothing nicer than a nice local stew chicken <laughs> instead of the, the, the frozen stuff that we get. So that's another aspect of promoting healthy lifestyles and promoting eating healthy foods, which links into our health issues and so on. So there's a number of, of areas that we have to tackle. The production side, the promotion of eating what we, what we produce, always bearing in mind that, that chicken is a very the cheapest source of protein in our diets, and we have to balance one with the other. Mm. Private sessions of the Government Information Service. Sir, um, has CARICOM taken a, a unified position um, on the decriminalization of cannabis? What is the position of CARICOM on this? You recall that we, the heads of government appointed a marijuana commission. And the Marijuana Commission reported, the, the, the commission report is actually available on our website for those who would wish to read it and to see what's being done. And it is the basis upon which our member states um, are utilizing to see how they treat the matter domestically. The commission was an independent commission. It was deliberately an independent commission that went out. I believe it was able to consult in all but two member states, um, if my memory serves correctly. So they got feedback from a range of different stakeholders, those in favor of, those in not in favor of, um, in terms of decriminalization or the use or the medicinal use of the herb. Um, we consulted, with, as I said, a wide range. So that document is the base document upon which member states would, at the national level, determine how they treated the matter. Because you still have contending interest groups at the national level that some say you should not decriminalize and some say you should um, keep the status quo. 
um, as it is. Um, so that's where we are. We've done the bit of work. It's, it's a tremendous piece of work. It's available to the public, very well informed from the medical standpoint, from the, the social standpoint, from the religious standpoint, from the impact on youth and the fact that you, you are caught with one spliff and you have a criminal record for, for how long. All of these matters were taken into account and the recommendations are there. The member states now need to determine how they act upon them. Mm -hmm. um, so, Ajah Alfred, Hot 7 TV. Um, my question is in regards to disaster management for member states um, in regards to assistance after a natural disaster. Is there a plan in place to aid? Um, if not, will this be part of discussions? Well, there is a, there is a system in place through CDEMA, the, CARICOM, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency, Emergency Management Unit that triggers a whole host of things immediately after, well, just prior to disaster when you know it's coming, because you can always see a hurricane coming. Most times you see a hurricane coming. Um, not, a, not an earthquake, unfortunately, but the hurricanes we can, we can predict with a few days. <coughs> and there's, a, there's a, a, a whole system in place that triggers um, immediate post-disaster relief. Um, you go into, into the, the immediate post-disaster is like to people rescuing people and that sort of thing. And the more long-term thing is to you know, generate the aid. And that, that system, in, in terms of, it includes the donors as well. And they meet regularly, um, not only during a disaster, pre-hurricane pre season, so already they've met. Um, that is a group that is chaired by the head of CEDEMA. The deputy chair is the head of UNDP. And UNDP coordinates, United Nations Development Program, coordinates with the other donors, and we see the donors. So that is there, but we're looking to see now, how do you strengthen that, because the experience we had with the hurricane season in 2017, when I believe nine countries of the Caribbean community, nine countries in the CARICOM were affected, if you include St. Martin. And how do you, where we had a substantial CARICOM population that, that were of interest to all of our member states, how do you strengthen um, what we have in place um, to provide assistance for a longer term? And, and going before that, as I mentioned before, what, how, do, how do member states access the resources that is necessary to build resilience. And resilience is not only about sea walls and, and bridges, you know. Resilience is about resilience in terms of, of the social resilience, the economic resilience. And those are some of the things that we're looking at. We're actually doing very quietly some work with CDEMA, with UNDP. Um, it's not yet ready to, to reach the stages of heads for a proposal on how you strengthen that mechanism. But it's, it's very much in place. In the meantime, we're strengthening our relations with those countries who have come to our assistance, um, France, the Netherlands, United States, the British, in terms of having a more coordinated response to disasters. Good morning, Joshua St. Amy from the St. Lucia Star. Um, going back to the cannabis question and CSME on a whole, with some countries moving forward with legislation, do you believe that with others not doing so that this can pose a threat or so also to CSME? Well, cannabis is not related to CSME in any, any way, shape, or form. It's not. So I, I'm not understanding. We're talking about the free movement of people and money and goods. Um, no, cannabis, you, you need to understand, cannabis right now is a banned substance for international trade, you know. It is governed by a protocol at the United Nations. And you, no country um, is allowed to trade in marijuana or marijuana products, unless it's under some very, I know there's some, some the question of how do you treat with, 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 with medications that are derived from the cannabis the plant. And even that is under some discussion. Even within the United States, where some of the states have liberalized, you can't transport the herb across the state borders, the state lines. So we're not encouraging anybody to one start moving with marijuana. You will be arrested. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> you're, we are moving a banned substance. But what we've done is looking at decriminalizing marijuana in the, at the national level, not about trading in the herb. Now we see a potential for medicinal marijuana. There are persons in our region who have done a lot of research on it, in Jamaica in particular. And I, I believe my memory is correct that they may even have patented, is the word patent? Yeah. The certain medications that are derived from it. And research is ongoing. And a number of member states are looking at how do you use that as a part of the industry, the pharmaceutical industry. That will be a very controlled industry, which is different than individuals having um, for recreational use or for religious use. Do not try to cross the border with uh, marijuana. You're going to be arrested. 
and, and for those countries where it's not decriminalized, you, you have to respect that the laws are still there. Until the government takes action, the laws are still there. You have to respect the laws. Good morning, Good Jesse morning. Leons, a Carib update. Uh, let's go back to the advancing of CSMA. Mm -hmm. um, the Commission on the Economy, you mentioned earlier that uh, there um, has been some progress, but not as much as, you, as, as would have been antici anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to the extent of, of what has not been done, perhaps? Give us some insight based on what mm -hmm. you know. I don't want, want you to let the cat out of the bag for Dr. Prasad, but if you could give us some extent mm -hmm. uh, as to what has not been done and how it will hamper our progress going forward mm -hmm. um, from this week. Well, I think the, the Commission on the Economy is looking at the growth, the bigger growth issues and not necessarily at the implementation plan on the CSME. That is separate. The, I've linked the two because the CSME pr provides a platform for economic growth. So his, the, 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 the commission will look at it more at a macro level. Some of the issues that are plaguing us on growth, debt, debt management, and those sort of things. On terms of the, in terms of the, um, the um, CSME plan, there's, for instance, give you an example of issues where I think that we are lagging behind that ought not to be lagging behind. The heads of government have agreed so far on 10 categories plus two for free movement in our community. I say 10 plus two because we have agreed on two additional, but the technical work to govern, to, to inform what will be the requirement for movement is still being done. So it is not yet operationalized. But the 10 categories plus agriculture workers and security personnel um, is what we're looking at as two new categories to be added. Of the 10 that have already been agreed, member states who were given the opportunity to, to pass the legislation, and in the interim, having not passed the legislation, because we know legislative agendas take time, to um, put in administrative procedures. The CCJ recognizes that member states can do that. Those who have passed the CARICOM Community Act, you can do that. And those who have passed, and all our member states have passed the CARICOM Treaty into law. So any obligation that comes out of it, they ought to be able to use administrative procedures to allow it to happen. What we are finding is that there are still member states who, are not, who have not passed the legislation, but worse yet, who have not put all of the administrative procedures in place to allow for that. And that's what we're going to be looking at. I'm not going to be calling names right now because persons I know We've had a series of meetings since the December meeting in December, one on one with the member states. And that has proven to be very, very helpful. And sometimes it's lack of understanding. I mean, I, I, I hate to say that, but on, on what needs to be done at the member state level. I'm, I'm sorry to put it that way, but the, the capacity doesn't seem to be there to go ahead and do what has to be done. So we're finding that since we've been having these one on one meetings with the member states individually, the technical staff at the CSMA unit, and that some of, we've seen some progress already from December. But we need to do more of that, more of the, more the hand-holding, unfortunately. We have to do more of it. We have a question mm -hmm. online, I understand. Yes, we do. Um, it's from um, Facebook, on um, CARICOM Facebook. Uh, from uh, Eddie Lane, News Update Guyana. What is CARICOM's position on the current political climate in Guyana following the, the passage of the December 21st No Confidence Motion? and what appears to be a position by the government to ignore the consequences. And basically they're asking, what is the, um, the position of CARICOM? Well, the matter is before the courts. It is what you call, what's that famous Sub-judiciary. Sub Sub and the community has a standard policy. When matters are before the courts, you let the court do what it has to do. The court, will, the court has met, the CCJ has met, they met on the, and they're going to meet again on the 12th of July. And we have to wait to see what happens. Um, we've been monitoring, I personally have been monitoring the situation very, very closely. I live in Guyana. This is my temporary home. Um, I have met with the, the president. I've met with the leader of the opposition on more than one occasion. So I'm receiving information, their views. But I am not going to make any public pronouncement until we know what is the situation. The court has to pronounce, and if um, we see what happens afterwards, if, if the pronouncements or the judgments, the, the, the subsequent judgments are not adhered to, then there's a problem. But until the, the judicial process is in review, I know people, persons are impatient, but there's, there's room for the judicial review, it's there. And we must allow this to happen, and we'll see what happens after the 12th of July. We have two more questions. Is the president of Haiti coming to the summit? Yes, he is. Will CARICOM therefore 
look at the situation unfolding in Haiti? Do there we expect there will be a discussion? A discussion. Yes. Right. I noticed when you asked, when you did your opening statement, you made no reference to the conflict, the ongoing conflict in Venezuela. Given the fact that at the la latest situation at the OAS, where you still had St. Lucia, Bahamas, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and another CARICOM, mm -hmm. and four CARICOM countries, mm -hmm. voting for a, a, an OAS resolution that more or less recognizes the representative of the opposition leader, Juan Guaido. Is CARICOM split on that issue? Or, or are we still maintaining, quote unquote, a fact? Uh, I, I don't want to use that word, but. <laughs> But just uh, for camera's sake, yeah. that they are united. Absolutely not. There are issues, it's not a, it, as you point out, there are issues on Venezuela upon which some member states have a different view. But there's a common view on a number of, of issues that we adhere to very, very strongly. The principle of non-interference, non-intervention. The issue that there must be dialogue um, between the opposition and the government. The issue of non-politicization of aid. The issue that there must be a peaceful resolution, the issue of the peace of the recognition of the constitution and the rule of law, all of which are principles up to this day that every single member state, whether they recognize Juan Guaido or not, or they recognize um, President Maduro or not, adhere to those principles, as distinct from others who are demanding that you know there be regime change or other other avenues. We cannot afford any kind of this thing to escalate into a kind of violent confrontation in, our, in, in, in Venezuela. Venezuela is part of the Caribbean in terms of the Caribbean Sea washes Venezuela, the neighbors, the closest neighbor, what, the two closest neighbors to uh, barring Colombia to Venezuela is, is, is Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. And their consequences, already we're seeing the consequences for Trinidad and Tobago in terms of what's happening in Venezuela with the number of refugees who are entering and the negative impact some of that may have on the, on the community. And it's not only as far as uh, uh, those two countries, they're moving up, they're moving up the chain of islands. So the region remains very united on these principles um, of non-interference, non-intervention, dialogue. We, and we were, the, we were the voice in the wilderness. They said, how could you be asking for dialogue when the situation is so bad? But guess what? There is dialogue taking place. And we have, the, the, the small group of heads have reached out and have done some things. And now we hear another country um, is, is, is um, um, allowing for dialogue to take place. So the community was spot on in terms of what the principles are here to. Given that when, um, Norway seems to be moving towards this situation in Venezuela, will that be a topic discussed at, at this meeting? Venezuela will be a topic to be discussed. Uh, well, I'm asking would, yes, Venezuela, Venezuela being is. discussed yeah. with Norway yeah. at this meeting? Well, Norway has taken a position of, as you have seen in the media, of not making any public pronouncements. I'd rather at this point not to comment on, as to whether or not there will be a discussion with Norway. I have to respect Norway in terms of how they're proceeding. From all, from all accounts, that they are, they, are making some, they are making some progress. This will be the third meeting, I believe, that's going to be held next week. Um, and I think we have to respect the process and respect the, the um, silence on, on this for the time being. Let us see what, if there's anything that we could, we could talk about afterwards. But for the time being, I would rather not comment on that. Final question. Yes. Thank you, Janika Simon again from Choice TV. This is uh, somewhat of a follow-up um, to my colleague about Venezuela. You mentioned that Trinidad and Guyana have seen the biggest impact in terms of human movement out of Venezuela. Is there any intention at this meeting or other meetings to have a CARICOM approach to not the political crisis, but the humanitarian crisis? What do we do with uh, Venezuelan migrants making their way up the chain. Is it fair for individual countries to have to bear the full brunt of having these migrants enter their borders? Or is this something that CARICOM can agree on a unified approach to easing that uh, humanitarian situation? Well, the, the issue of the issues of, of refugees is one, as you know, that is not unique to our region. We, we, we know what's happening in other parts of the world. And it's these things are issues are governed by international Convention international law. Um, and basically, the region pr subscribes to those issues. Of course, the, uh, uh, the, the costs of these things can be quite prohibitive. Um, and these two countries are 
especially Trinidad and Tobago, that's where the, the, the greatest number thus far. Um, so we are apprised of what is going on. And think, is there a common position? I think um, the, the other countries are not experiencing anywhere near that. The only other countries I understand that, um, which are, well, they're not even associated with us. I'm speaking ahead of my time as well. What you mentioned, Aruba and Curacao, but they're not part of us yet. So I know they're also experiencing. There is exchange of information. I'm sure we'll be briefed on what's going on. Um, but it's an issue, I, I, from what I can read in the media and, and some of other conversations, that Trinidad is trying its best to handle, and, and Guyana as well. Uh, Guyana having such a vast border, borderline, um, territory, territorial border with, with Venezuela. Are we, are we, as CARICOM, kind of leaving our sister countries of Trinidad not at all, not out, at all. out to dry? Because not at all. They are, they are the ones that are... Not at, not at all. Not at all. We're not leaving out to dry, but I do not know what, what else would be expected um, of, of the rest of the community in that particular instance as of now. Um, let us see what happens. That I'm sure some of these issues will be discussed. Uh, we know what, what is happening to regularize the persons who come in. And um, let's see what happens with that. Thank you very much to yeah. members of the media. Thank you very much, Secretary General. And we look forward to a very fruitful meeting and the press conference at the end where I hope to see as many of you as are here today. Thank you very much. Let me add my own words of thank you to members of the media. Thank you very much.